long this morning. Pray for me and pray for God's word. And I pray that your ears and hearts are open to hearing what God has for you. During this Lenten season, we turn our attention to details leading to the death of Jesus, including those last words, those seven last words he spoke on the cross. Roxbury Presbyterian Church has participated for many years in the United Lenten Service. And I was honored to be a part of it this year, a few weeks back. I preached at St. Augustine, St. Martin Church in the South End. I was assigned to preach on Jesus' first words on the cross. Words that are still shocking to hear. Words that really don't fit the scene. Words that tell us about the nature of God and our potential as God's people but words that just always take my breath away. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me just take you to this scene. It was an ugly scene. Jesus, the Messiah, the savior of the whole world, hoisted up on a vertical pole, a stake, his arms splayed wide, set up to die by the most demeaning and gruesome method of execution available in Rome. The Romans reserved death by crucifixion for its worst offenders. It was a painful and protracted way to execute criminals, as much a threat as it was a punishment. There is a story that the Romans had done this to thousands of people. A slave by the name of Spartacus built up a huge army to overthrow the Roman government, and he was killed in battle. And the, the story goes that 6,000 of his followers were crucified on the road from Rome to Capua, one cross at a time. 6,000 crosses to prove that Rome was in control, and you would not buck that authority. You would not go against that control there was a serious consequence for wrongdoing. This was the worst conceivable way to die, and Jesus, the hope of the world, is up on a cross. What could this be? Some people in the crowd have left. The hanging itself has taken place. The heavy wrought nails, the iron nails, have been driven in both wrists. Another equally heavy nail is driven through the arches of his feet. All that is left is a death watch, a slow, grotesque, humiliating death occurring right before eyes. Some in the crowd, even the toughest, most cynical observers, turn their heads. The great irony of this moment is it didn't have to happen this way. I, I, I preach this story, even though we haven't even gotten to Good Friday, because God wants you to know how ugly this scene really was. And it didn't really have to happen this way. Remember, we're not talking about just a man being crucified. We're talking about the Son of God, the one who himself had raised the dead and walked on water and turned water into wine. With one quick burst of divine force, he could have ended this horror. He could have ended the world that day, but he didn't. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. So as ugly as the scene is, we need to repeat this scene so we can remember what was happening physically. Because of the way Jesus' body has been placed on the wooden beams, air can come into his lungs, but is difficult to exhale. Breathing is almost impossible, let alone speaking. But he chooses to speak. His blood-blurred eyes tilt toward heaven, and the first thing he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not a word in his own defense, not a reminder of who he is, not a threat or a judgment. Of all the things the Lord could say, forgiveness was on his mind. Now let's think about that. Forgiveness on any level is, is difficult. Psychologists tell us it is counterintuitive. It is not the natural response to wrongdoing. Humans are actually hard 
wired not to forgive. Holding on to the hurt and pain is a survival mechanism. Retaliation is an impulse. The last thing you or I might consider, and we might have some words up there on the cross, but I'm sure under horrific circumstances, forgiveness would not be up there. But the first thing on Jesus' mind after he is placed on the cross is to ask his father to pardon, acquit, to absolve his killers. Perhaps he's asking for forgiveness for Herod, a pilot, the priest, the disciples, the crowd, the world, you and me. And the uniqueness of this moment, the really bizarre part of this moment, is there is a prayer for forgiveness without apology. Nobody came up to the cross and said, I'm sorry. Nobody said this was a mistake. Nobody on the hill to this point has asked Jesus for anything. So what are we to make of this moment? Especially since the Bible teaches us that repentance, confession, contrition are all rules of engagement of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all righteousness. I have prayed on this little text. I have studied it. I have read countless commentary on this moment that Duke theologian William Willimon calls preemptive forgiveness because it seems to contradict everything I've been taught about the need for apology. Everything I feel about the need for apology. But as I continue to meditate, I begin to focus on the rest of that sentence. It says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For they know not what they do. I want to meditate on these words just for a few seconds because I think this is a recurring theme of the Bible. I think this is the problem of the whole world. A whole world that doesn't know what it's doing because it doesn't know God. This is why we talk so much about our need to grow in our relationship with Christ. This is eternal life, the Bible says, that we might know God and Jesus whom God sent. And you see, when you don't know God, you don't know nothing. That's what I have come to believe. If you don't learn to, to get to know God, I don't care how many degrees you have, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care where you are in the status of humanity, you know nothing. When we worked in Sudan, and we worked there for 11 years, we, after so many years of visiting and only staying there for a few weeks at a time, we realized there were no animals in South Sudan. None. There were no lions, no giraffes, no elephants, gazelles. And so we asked him, where are the animals? And he said, you know, this war in Sudan has been going on for two decades, and the animals left. The animals went to Kenya. They went to the Congo. They went to Saudi Arabia. The animals are gone. And if you think about that, the animals got it. People still fighting. Animals said, hey, this is enough for us. We know nothing, but we think we know. There was a story in the news just two or three weeks ago. I know you heard it. A woman was texting and walked into a train. That's a real story. Go Google it. Now, we have been told time and time again, don't text and drive, don't text and walk. And, we, and I bet you I don't bet because I'm a preacher, but if I were a betting person, I would say one out of every two people in here still texts. We don't, why are we driving? Why are we walking? She walked into a train. She survived. We don't know. We think we know, but we know nothing. How can people starve in the same country where we throw away food? We don't know nothing. Why would somebody abuse a child? We don't know. And Christians are just as guilty as anyone else. We say we love the Lord, but we don't know how to love each other. We know nothing. We don't have a clue what we are doing. And the irony to me, the real joke is that we don't know that we don't know. You see, mankind is arrogant. We think we know everything. The gap between man and God is our arrogance that we don't need God, or some of us have the arrogance to believe we are God. We don't know. 
Since our very creation, we have rebelled against God. We have been lost from the very beginning. You know, God's first words to Adam and Eve when, when, he, when they have uh, defla defiled him and, and, and gone against him and disobeyed him. God says, where are you? And Adam had no idea. He didn't know. When he asked, well, what happened? Well, she said, he said, the snake said. We, have, we don't know. Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't forgive us because we just don't know. We don't know what we're doing. You know how you catch a child doing something wrong, and when you say, why'd you do that? I don't know. <laughs> now, I'm not saying we're innocent. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying we're lost. I'm saying we're ignorant. Paul said this, for what I do is not the good I want to do. The evil I do not want, I keep on doing. It's the conundrum of being human. We just don't know. You know, one of my favorite rituals as a pastor is the baptism of babies. This is an expression of the doctrine of grace in Reformed theology. Many other denominations don't do this. This is really peculiar to our denomination, to our tradition. It is so God that God gives us grace before we're even aware of who God is. That God takes the initiative for our salvation. That God chooses to create the world. God chooses to be revealed. God chooses to love us and to forgive us. Despite who we are and all that we don't know. And so my message this morning, this afternoon, just for a few seconds, is we need to learn more about forgiveness. Because through forgiveness, I think we can learn more about God, more about God's love. Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love is inextricably bound to grace inextricably bound to forgiveness. It would seem there wouldn't be one without the other. God loves us and God's grace saves us. I wonder, and this is just my theology that I'm working out as I'm growing. So I'm not saying this is fact, this is my wonder. If, if that criminal on the cross, the one who turned to Jesus and said, remember me, I wonder if he asked that because he heard Jesus seek forgiveness for everybody. I wonder if that, those words didn't just touch that criminal soul like they touch mine. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness must never be mistaken for weakness. Jesus was not weak. God is not weak. God's grace frees us and heals us the forgiver like nothing else can. And we confess, just like that thief said, remember me, we confess because we're sinners, but we confess because of God's grace. You see what I'm saying? We're asking for forgiveness, but we're asking for forgiveness because God has grace that is sufficient. So do we need to learn to forgive without apology? I don't know. I don't know. But I think so. I think so. Now that's hard. You know, you get on Route 93 and people just, you know, flinging and crazy and driving crazy. I wonder if we wouldn't just get up in the morning and say, Lord, I just forgive everybody just gonna mess with me today. I forgive everybody today. Let me try this, God, and see what happens. God's grace frees us as the forgiver. We forgive because God first forgave us. Forgiveness is being able to accept the messiness, the ignorance of our lives, to realize our limitations and love anyway. We love because God loved us first. I thank God that we are forgiven over and over and over again. I thank God because your grace is amazing. Jesus asked God to forgive us because only forgiveness can bridge the gap between God and humankind. 
only through the grace and sacrifice of Jesus can we be restored back to God. This is what makes God good. This is what makes God God. Because if it was left up to us, I don't know. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for your grace. That your son forgave us because we have no clue what's going on. Yet we sin day in and day out. We forget you day in and day out. God, we know there are consequences for our sins. We know that death is the consequence, Lord. But we thank you for your grace and your mercy along the way. Teach us to forgive those, God, who turn against us, even if they don't apologize, so that we can be set free as only you can set us free. Don't let your gifts just tangle in the dirt. No, yeah. Use what you got to edify the church. From the to the end.